Okay, if you'd like to join me, we're going to be in the 11th Psalm this afternoon. Uh, before we get there, though, I want to kind of keep pace with what we've been doing. I want to give you a brief rundown of Psalm 9 and 10. Uh, last week, we looked at Psalm 8. We considered the uh, benevolence of God toward humanity. Uh, and we spent some time looking at uh, the majesty and the glory of God. And that as we survey the enormity of God, uh, that we are brought to the stunning truth that God is mindful of us, despite our smallness. Uh, what is man that you would be mindful of us was what we talked through. And moving forward, uh, just to give you a quick rundown of both Psalm 9 and 10. In Psalm 9, uh, it opens with David's intentions to joyfully praise the Lord for all of his wonderful deeds. And David also remarks on the total victory uh, that is possible, not through his own power, uh, but instead through the power of the Lord. Uh, so then David closes Psalm 9 by declaring his confidence uh, in uh, the reality that the total ruin of those uh, who oppose God is sure to come. And that all the wicked nations who refuse to acknowledge God will eventually perish. And so this really uh, reveals to us that although it may seem like trouble is prevailing, that we place our trust into a sure rescue that comes from the Lord alone uh, because of the complete work of Christ on our behalf. That no matter what would be before us, we fear nothing, uh, even death, because those to whom the Father has given to the Son uh, we are assured of eternity. And so similarly, Psalm 10 uh, looks at the supposed prosperity of the wicked. Uh, David basically laments the, uh, what he perceives to be the inactivity of God against the wicked. Uh, sort of giving us a picture, uh, a contemporary image, if you will, of our society today that when we survey the reality of the world around us, we might be tempted to despair because of what looks like the good fortune of the wicked. Uh, and with a dose of truth, uh, this psalm leads us to realize that unless we find our help in the Lord, as the psalmist did, uh, we will fall into complaint and grumbling. And this psalm really reminds us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ because any apparent prosperity of the wicked is short-lived because the Lord Jesus Christ will return. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so there's your quick Wikipedia version of Psalm 9 and 10, which moves us into Psalm 11, which we'll spend the rest of our time studying this afternoon. And so let me read this for us, and then we'll walk through this, particularly spending time in verse 1 through 3. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Now, the background of this psalm uh, brings to us once again a rather familiar uh, setting because we see David once again in trouble, in peril. It's speculated um, that this was written at the time uh, to which David was situated in Saul's court, uh, this moment in time to where Saul had uh, rather sort of become unstable or unhinged, started to become this. 
And this is possibly at the time to where David began to feel the resentment of Saul increasing. Uh, Regardless of what the background is, what is sensed is that whether um, by his own fear or by the advisement of some counselor that he is referring to, uh, David is tempted to flee in fear. He starts out verse one. He says, the Lord in the Lord, I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? And so we sense in a very real and tangible way that David has this urge to uh, run away. And so let's just be honest with each other. Uh, In a lot of ways, that would have been easier. It's more predictable. Uh, It helps diminish the unknown. There's certainly more control in fleeing um, rather than dealing with what is in front of you. And no doubt there is less uncertainty in fleeing. And so whether these are actual advisors that are telling David to flee to the mountain or whether this is just David's fear that is counseling him to flee towards the mountains, uh, whatever the case, uh, David is in this place where he has to combat this urge and he has to remind himself of uh, who he knows God to be, God's sovereign rule and control of the circumstance that he finds himself in. And so the advice of his fear in this moment is to flee. The, the counsel of his uncertainty is to spin into distress. The alluring of ease is certainly increasing and becoming more attractive as the minutes, I'm sure, go by. And so David's circumstance is telling him that there's nothing left for him to do but to flee, uh, to flutter away like a bird uh, flying to safety. And so this is interesting because I thought about us. And the reality is, is that as we go through this life, Um, This could be said of us at some point, maybe at other points we've done better, uh, but we are not very good at enduring or persevering for that or persisting. Uh, we, We often fall victim to avoidance in hopes that we will experience some sort of a remedy and comfort. Because what we see in this psalm and what we see in our lives is that fear would tell us and advise us to respond in this way, to just run away from it, to just get away from it. Fear would advise us to retreat. Fear would encourage us to elude. But you see, this counsel is problematic for the Christian Because we, as those who put our faith in Christ, um, we are called to dependence. And we are exhorted to be settled in the care and the provision of the Lord. And so as we deal with difficult circumstance and trouble, as we've been looking at these few weeks prior to today, uh, we have to be people who live our lives completely dependent on the sovereign rule of the Lord. And so as we continue on, uh, we actually see in verse 2 the reasons that the king should flee. David says they bend their bow, they've fitted their arrows, they shoot in the dark at an upright heart. David paints this picture of this attack uh, coming in secret. Uh, that an ambush is being set, a covert operation, a backdoor attack, a disguised onslaught, that there is no place into which uh, the arrows of the enemies could not penetrate. That's the possibility of death uh, followed David as his inseparable attendant And it seemed as if there were no escape from his enemies. And so it's safe to assume that if we were in a a similar state, 
um, that this would encourage us to flee. This would certainly encourage David to flee because known enemies can be dealt with and prepared for. It's the unknown enemies that are intimidating. It's that which we are uncertain of that are often our loudest advisors. It's the unknown that often agitate our concentrated trust in the Lord. It's the unexpected that employs our tendencies to be motivated by fear and fret. And so this is not really surprising to us, especially because we are often on the receiving end of attack, if you will. But what makes this overwhelming is not just that the wicked are launching their arrows and fashioning their spears and, and, and plotting and planning as we've looked at in the other Psalms. We know that this is true. What makes this overwhelming is that we are the target. I'm not exaggerating that to prove a point. The reality is, is we do have an adversary. We do have an enemy. I'm not saying that for shock factor, but many of us never really consider that we might be in the midst of enemy territory. I'm not saying that we're always there. I'm not saying that we're special, you know, and that there's like a, a mark on us that singles us out. You ever talk to those people who say they're the only ones that are ever under any distress or you know, that they're the only ones that are always being attacked or they're the only ones that have ever, ever experienced this. I'm not saying that. Uh, what I am saying is that we can often find ourselves in this place to where we certainly are under some sort of attack. And, and we're confronted in that moment with an alternative in moments of crisis. And it's to either make God our refuge or to create our own refuge, uh, to fashion a straw man instead of clinging to our strong tower. It's at its core asking, whom will we ultimately trust? Uh, will we trust in the Lord or will we trust in ourselves and our own devices to get us out of the place that we often find ourselves? In essence, who will be the Lord of our lives? And we see this tension uh, in this as we consider verse 3. And David says in verse 3, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, the word destroyed here is the word horus. And it means to tear down or to break down, to overthrow. Uh, to ruin or to destroy when uh, the building has collapsed because the foundations have been compromised, um, when it seems that what shields the, the righteous from the ravages of the wicked has been removed, if the walls are torn down and it seems uh, that the righteous cannot defend themselves in such a situation, uh, the wicked in their arrogance and confidence oppose the the question, what can the righteous do? And this really paints a picture of the wicked as being those who taunt and they uh, threaten, they intimidate, and they bully. In their exaggerated certainty of triumph over the righteous, they provoke us to flee to the mountains. This is too big for you. You can't deal with this. This is outside of God's care. This is outside of God's sovereignty. And they taunt us and manipulate us and deceive us and call us to flee to the mountains. When morality is undermined and evil sweeps seemingly unchecked, when God's word is attacked and its teachings are ridiculed and ignored, when supposed Christians uh, support the rising tide of unbelief, when family values continue to crumble, when everything around us seems to be giving way, it may raise the question, what can the righteous do? Well, for one, they can go on being righteous. 
And secondly, they can take a stand against prevailing evil. And we can continue on in this list. But what they cannot do and what we should not consider doing is flee to the mountains. And this translates to our lives really well because it's frustrating to feel powerless in the face of crumbling foundations. And for some, if not careful, they can too easily become convinced that there is nothing that we can do. And so we listen to the poor advice of our circumstance and our fear and our confusion, and we are tempted to flee. Yet the reality is that we are called to continue in righteousness, to practice the discipline of consciously taking refuge in the Lord, and that although the mountains seem enticing, especially when things don't make much sense, we struggle on, and we encourage ourselves and our hope for deliverance. You see, the, the Christian life should be marked by perseverance, steadfastness, stamina, and, and resoluteness. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of pre preacher, said, None are truly Christ's but those who persevere in grace. Temporary Christians are not really Christians. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in, your, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Fleeing should be an unthinkable compromise. Contrasting that in verse 4 and 5. Coming against this urge to run away, David celebrates the fact that God is sovereign and that he is aware of everything. He knows that God cares deeply for his people and for righteousness. Verse 4 and 5, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test, his, test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And then we see David close this psalm with a prayer for God's judgment to fall on evil people. He says, let them rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds and the upright shall behold his face. For many, thinking of God's judgment brings fear and trembling. But for us, knowing that God is just and that God is judge and that God will judge we should rejoice in that. We should find peace in that. It's not something to bemoan or to fret or to be concerned by. It's something that we, as those who have been given to the Son by the Father, we rejoice in the fact that God is judge. It's interesting, the first line of the psalm showed where the believer's safety lies, and that's in the Lord. In the Lord, I take refuge. And then the last line of this psalm shows us where the believer's heart should be, to behold his face. And so, all in all, when David considers the greatness of God, the care of God, the vision of God, it outweighs uh, the danger for David. Uh, trusting God was the safest move of all. And if you know the story, at some point, David will flee. David will run. 
away out of fear. But in this circumstance, David, again, he ran. But he did not flee to the mountains. He runs right into the care of the Lord. He did flee. He flees right into the throne of grace. And so as we consider Psalm 11, this is a psalm for our time as well. It shows us how to trust despite our questions and our difficulty. And it points to David's greater descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When the mountains are tempting, and when we contemplate the threats of the wicked, and when fear is our counsel, for those who are in Christ, we stand confident that the wicked will be judged. We rejoice in knowing that the wicked will be judged and that our hope is rooted in knowing that we will behold the glory of God in the face of Christ. All who sincerely depend on the grace of God given a righteousness that is not our own through the complete work of the cross, shall be safe and shall be protected. It is not by flight, but by confidence that we face the challenges that come before us. It's in the Lord that we take refuge. And my prayer is that that statement never becomes a truth that is overstated, that we remind ourselves constantly and frequently that we find refuge in the Lord and in the Lord alone, that all of the small constructs that we work in our lives, that we build in our lives, that they cannot protect us, they cannot sustain us, they cannot watch over us, for the Lord is the only one in whom we find refuge. For the Lord is our only source of hope. So, Father, as we come to your word and as we gather in this space, I pray that these would not just be words on a page or words that are spoken, but that they would become a truth that we are dependent on. And, Lord, I ask you that you be with us as we continue to live out our lives in knowing and being confident in your sovereignty and your goodness. I ask you, Lord, that you would be with us this day, that you would remind us of what it is, Lord, that you want us to know, that you would show us and reveal to us, Lord, what it is that you want us to see. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.